right, good morning, early birds. Good to see y'all as we prepare to worship this morning. Uh, before we get underway, I want to point out some of the things in the, in the life of the church. Uh, so if you can be pulling that out while you're getting that, good morning to y'all on Facebook. Thank you for being with us this morning. We are really glad that you are spending your Sunday morning with us. Uh, okay, just a couple of things to point out. Um, coming up in just a couple of Sundays, we have our annual Scout Sunday. So uh, we are really pleased that we are the charter organization for Scout Troop 209 and Scout Pack 20. And every year we have a Scout Sunday where we celebrate that relationship. And the boys from Troop 209 are going to cook a pancake breakfast for us. That's going to be downstairs in the fellowship hall between the two services. So y'all come with an appetite and come and feast on pancakes. We're going to, in the services, we will celebrate scouting. And, um, you know, we'll have a recognition of the scouts, recognition of Eagle Scouts that are in our midst. And uh, it's, it's, it's always a, a good Sunday. So I hope you can join us for that. And then um, coming up, we've got a couple of really good outreach concerts coming up on February 10th. We have Bluegrass Band, My Brother's Keeper. They're a very, very popular local act. Uh, we're doing this in partnership with our friends at the Downtown Listening Room. Um, so, it, so if you want to reserve a, a ticket, there's a suggested $15 donation for that, and you would do that through their website because they're handling all the management of that. But then coming up on, uh, in March... On March 16th, we've got Daryl Mosley back. And remember him, he's a Nashville singer-songwriter. Uh, very, it, it was a very popular event last year. A lot of folks really loved and enjoyed that. So just mark that on your calendar, March 16th. We do need a few people that can help us out with things like greeting and, and, and you know, pre prepping the space and whatnot. And so if you'd be up for being a part of that, uh, you can mark that on your connect card if you take a look at your connect card we have op, uh, a place where you can indicate your interest for th these events and some of the other things that we have going on that would really help us in the office if you just mark that you're interested in being a part of that um, one other thing about the connect card um, we started this a couple of weeks ago where i'm just asking um uh, if God's been working in your life this week, I've tweaked the question this week because we are coming to the end of this Abide series. And I'm curious, how's it been going for you? Um, has God been doing anything in your life through this series? And so I'm just asking if you'd be willing to just give me a little feedback. What's God been doing with you and in your life during this series? Uh, just tell me a story. That would be really terrific. And so what uh, what we're going to do, also, um, just remember, after the sermon, we have that time of reflection. I believe that God is talking to all of us all throughout this worship service. He's talking to you right now, if we had but ears to hear. And so I'm just going to be inviting you through the worship service to be listening to the prompting of the Lord. And use that page with the questions, what are you hearing from the Lord during this service? Just jot down anything that comes to you all during this worship service is a great place to take note of that. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to take just a, a minute of time, and Roy's got a little ambient music he's going to play. Just take a minute and go over that Connect card. If you've got a story to tell, this is a great time to do it. If you have prayer requests or praises to share on the front side of the Connect card, this is a great time to do it. But let's just take one minute of time and fill out that Connect card.
Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus.
speaking Jesus, let's speak Jesus to each other as we turn to each other and give the love of Jesus to our neighbor, to our friend, to our brother and sister in Christ. Peace be with you. good to be together. It's good to be together in the name of the Lord. It's good to be with God's people. It's good to see each other. Peace of the Lord be on all of us. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. It is so good to worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's so good to speak the name of Jesus, to speak the name of Jesus over everyone here, to speak the name of Jesus over addiction, to speak the name of Jesus over anxiety, to speak the name of Jesus over depression. We do speak the name of Jesus this morning. Jesus, we are so grateful that you have saved us and called us, not according to our works, but according to your wonderful thoughtfulness and grace. Lord, we're being called in our congregation, our community to abide in you. And we are so thankful that we get to do that together here this Sunday morning, to abide in you and to rest in you. So Lord, we bring ourselves to you now in the quiet of our hearts, in the quiet of this place. We bring our hearts to Jesus. We open ourselves to you. Jesus, come and fill us. Jesus, come and touch us. Jesus, come and comfort us. Lord, we pray for this needy world, Jesus. We're conscious of conflicts and wars in Ukraine and the Middle East and the Holy Land, the Red Sea. We call out for your peace and your resolution to untie knocks that only you can untie. We bring ourselves as we bring this needy world to you. And we come uh, to you, our God, with the prayer that our Lord Jesus gave us to pray together. And so let us all say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we are God's people called to fellowship, worship him, and serve him. And we have the opportunity to be involved in a summer project, and I think we're going to hear about that right now. Good morning. Last week, Max presented an introduction to the mission trip with the Appalachia Service Project. And as we're trying to assemble our crew for this summer's trip, um, 
we thought that this week we'd give you a little bit more uh, personal stories about the impact that the 2022 trip had on us. What sticks with me personally the most is what I learned about the people from this church that I was working with who were members of my team. Christy Lowe was our, um, was our leader of our group. And I didn't, I mean, I know that Christy's sweet and all, but I didn't know how extremely patient and positive and supportive and what a wonderful teacher she is. So that, that has stuck with me since, and I was, I'm really glad I got to learn that about Christy. The other thing I learned was about the teenagers in my group. You know, teenagers sometimes get picked on a little bit. So they can be tough, right? But the teenagers in my group were my son and uh, Christy's son, Elijah, and Henry Brown, our little Eagle Scout. And, um, you know, the whole Brown family is so impressive. And Henry is certainly right, right up there with his sisters and parents. But I didn't know about Henry that he is an extremely sincere kid. He's eager to please and, and very kind. And I'm glad that I got to know these people from our church that well. The thing that impacted me most was um, the family that we were working for down there. They were a young couple named Josh and Casey, I believe was his wife's name. And they had a one-year-old baby and he was just the cutest thing. He had great big puffy cheeks and curly black hair and, and uh, they were just a neat family. And um, they had a cat and a dog and the dog was really, really skinny for obvious reasons because there probably wasn't much food available, especially for the dog. But um, they were a, a joy to serve. Um, what impacted me the most was also, like Russ said, the family, because we had we were working to build a ramp for an older lady, and she had her family come by to her house a lot, and she had a daughter who was, I think, nine or ten, and she would talk with me uh, and my friends, Beanie and Peyton, and we would all talk about things, and she would tell us about her life and stuff. And one day we even ended up like making her sandwiches and stuff whenever we went to the older lady's house to go work for lunch because she would come and hang out with us during lunch. And even after we left Virginia, we still kept in touch with her. Like, I think more than a year after, so. One thing that um, sticks with me is the um, perspective it gave me on how other people in the world live. Um, uh, also, when Ken puts me to the test, I can actually help construct stuff. It wasn't a career change, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it felt good to be able to help others. I was on the same team with Lynn, and I have to tell you, there were times when I was having them do certain tasks, and I would laugh just watching them trying to use tools that they had never used before, but they really grew and they really learned that week. But I think the thing that impressed me the most and stuck with me the most was the huge cultural difference between the way we live here and the way they live down there. The house that we were working on was over 100 years old. It was in dismal condition, not that they didn't try to take care of it, but it was just rotting. And 
a lot of what was being done was to stabilize that house so that it would be good to live in for another hundred years. The thought of tearing it down and replacing it wasn't even a consideration because this house had been in this family for generations. And it's just a whole different culture and it was really neat to learn about these folks. And um, I'm ready to go back and I hope that you'll all join us. Thank you. Sir, thank you to our representatives from the mission team. And uh, I hope that uh, you'll prayerfully consider, I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about mission a little bit later during the service. Um, but uh, what, one of the things I hoped just, it struck me as we were singing that last praise song, I want to speak the name of Jesus. And, and that we as followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ have been given the power to speak grace and mercy and kindness and goodness over people's lives. And we do that in action, like with the Appalachia Service Project. And we do that in deeds of loving kindness. And we do that in, in just simple words. And so as we come to the time of the offering, uh, I want you to be thinking about how are you called to offer the words of Jesus, the love of Jesus? How are you called this week to speak the name of Jesus, the love of Jesus, and the peace of Jesus into the lives of people you encounter this week. Let's take up the tithe and the offering.
Would you please stand with us? Today's scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. And may God add his blessing to the reading and to the teaching of his word. Amen. All right, we continue through our Abide series. We are coming close to the end of this Abide series. And um, where we've been thus far, just as a reminder, the, the whole thrust of the series is talking about the rhythms of life that Jesus practiced and taught his disciples. And, and the, the, in these rhythms of life, it's about intentionally connecting with God, it's saying our mindset to, to very intentionally connect with God, and not just God in some kind of vague, ethereal sense, but to, to connect with the personal living God, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to discover more about God's character, about God's person, about God's affection for you, about God's excellency, and then also to listen to God, to, to be taught by God on how to live wisely and well, how to experience the abundant life that Jesus promises. And, and how to actually bring about, be instruments of his kingdom in our lives. That's why we spend time abiding with the Lord. And so we've talked about the daily time, you know, taking some time each day to be still, to, to encounter God's word and to listen to the Holy Spirit speaking through God's word, not just intellectually studying it to get facts down, but to listen. What's the Holy Spirit speaking through the word? And then um, you know, we took a couple of weeks on that. Last week, we talked about the idea of one day in seven, a Sabbath, a, a, a day to abide, to focus on relationships, rest, and restorative practice. And the idea of relationships, not just relationship with God, but also relationship with those we love, those whom God has put into our lives. So a day set apart to focus on relationship, rest, and restorative practice. And that these things are, are powerful, intentional times where God shapes us, teaches us, molds us, sends us. And so, you know, I hope you've been getting a lot out of that. I hope you'll tell me some stories about that. I hope you've been trying to practice these. Um, by the way, 
just as a commercial nestled here in this, if, if you are feeling called, like you really want to practice these disciplines and, and, and want to go deeper into this, Tammy and I are going to be hosting two small groups starting in March. I'm calling them Abide Groups. And they're small groups where we are going to intentionally focus on helping one another practice these disciplines. So we'll be working our way through a devotional commentary on the Gospel of Luke, but don't think of this as a traditional Bible study of Luke. You're going to learn a lot about the Gospel of Luke through, the, through your daily readings and practice, but the point of the group is to help one another. Hey, how are you doing with a daily abide time, with a weekly um, Sabbath? And what are you hearing from the Lord? To help one another listen to what's God saying through the abide time. So I do encourage you, um, you know, we are asking for a commitment of trying to actually make a good faith effort of trying to do those disciplines. Um, it, it'll be about a 15 week experience. And so we've got room, they will be small groups, so to keep them small, we've only got room for eight people. One will be on Sunday afternoons at one, one will be on Tuesday nights at six. And so I do encourage you to prayerfully consider whether God is calling you to take that next step and, and be a part of one of these groups with us. Um, okay, so we've, we've, we've talked about some practices. This week, I want to focus on the idea of retreat. So one of the things we, we, that I never really paid close attention to until a few years ago was how Jesus takes his disciples away. And you notice this, that he, he and his disciples are going away to a secluded place. And he does this from time to time. Um, oftentimes in the Gospels, that away trip is being interrupted by somebody. But, but the interruption is, is a momentary interruption. And the Gospel writers include it for uh, you know, a purpose to kind of show Jesus' goodness and his authority and his kindness. Um, you know, one of the great examples of that was when they go up north into Syria and there's the Syrophoenician woman who comes and asks for healing and Jesus says, no, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And she says, but even the dogs under the table get the crumbs. You might remember that story. And, and Jesus is like, I'm going to interrupt my time of rest and do some healing because here's someone with genuine faith. They're not just coming for, you know, this. he recognizes something in her. So, so he's interruptible on these retreats, and yet he practices them. And, and this is one, the story we have here today is a picture of one of those retreats where he doesn't get interrupted. And I particularly like this. So the idea of a retreat, and I'm suggesting to you that Jesus is teaching and demonstrating that for all of his disciples, that's for all of us, occasional times of retreat, which I'm defining retreat as getting out of your context for a time to intentionally focus on God and to advance in your faith. Getting out of your context is different from a vacation. A vacation, you, you probably get out of your context for a while to, to rest, relax, enjoy experiences, enjoy the goodness of wherever it is you're going. Nothing wrong with vacations. Vacations are, I rather like vacations. <laughs> but a retreat, remember our, our buzzword for this, intentionality. A retreat is getting out of your context to intentionally focus on God. And so, we see here a retreat. But but we have to kind of understand a little bit. So right there in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, that's one of the things that tells us right there, it's a retreat. Caesarea Philippi is far to the north in modern day Israel. It would have been out of Galilee. It's, it's almost at the base of Mount Hermon. You're really close to Mount Hermon. Um, and, and, and it is this lush region. Today there is a huge uh, botanical park there in Israel um, where one of the massive springs that's the headwaters of the Jordan River is there. And there's, you know, in the Banyas State Park or National Park, there, there, you know, it's just this magnificent forested wooded area with a glorious waterfall. Sadly, our, our group was not able to go this, um, this summer or this fall because that was, you know, it's so far north, 
in, in Israel, in modern day Israel, that it would have been a very dangerous area. It's very close to the, the Lebanon border and, and our group was not able to go. I have been before and it is something I never expected to experience in Israel because it is so remote and lush and glorious and it's the perfect setting to get out of your context and get into reflecting and relaxing and listening to God. Now, one of the interesting things about this region of Caesarea Philippi, it was you know, a, an ancient center of pagan worship as well. So not far from the waterfalls, there is a section that I, I, I liken it to a pagan pigeon forge because there, 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 there's like all these different shrines and it would have been a tourist attraction for the pagans to, to come to the shrine of the emperor and here's another shrine to somebody else and then here's a shrine to the great god Pan and, and you know, it's just this area of, of all of these shrines and it would have been a tourist draw for, for many particularly wealthy people in the pagan world to kind of go up to that region. And, and hang out. Uh, but then there's also lots of lovely secluded areas, and um, you know, it's reasonable to think that Jesus perhaps was in one of these secluded areas. I, 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 I like to imagine him up by the waterfall having this conversation with the disciples. That's, that's where I imagine it. I like to imagine it. Um, so, so he's gotten out of his normal setting of ministry and his normal setting of work in his normal place of vocation to a special place. But he's there with his disciples so that they can focus more intentionally on advancing in faith. And so we see um, Jesus just drives right to it. You know, see, they're in Caesarea Philippi. He's gathered them around. They're on retreat. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And you see, that's where we get the intentionality. He is... He's asking some deeper probing questions. Remember how I talked last week, for those of you who were with us, I talked last week about the idea of a one day in seven. It's the saw sharpening experience. You know, if you're cutting down a tree, you want to sharpen the saw, uh, you know, so that you can be effective. And, and that, I suggest, is what this is as well. You know, for us to be moving forward in life, every so often we got to step back and ask the big questions. If you don't step back and ask the big questions, how do you know you're going in the right direction? How do you know that what you're doing is really worthwhile? If you don't step back and ask the big questions from time to time, believe me, the big questions are going to force themselves upon you in something called a midlife crisis or a late life crisis or some other kind of existential crisis in your life. The questions will be asked one way or another, we can be intentional about it and ask them in the setting of we're encountering God. And that's what I'm asking us all to do. And so the big questions, you know, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do you say that I am? And that is probably the biggest question for anyone. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who is Jesus? Really? Not just intellectually to you, who is Jesus? Oh, yes, well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. But who is he to you existentially? Is he your Lord and Savior? Do you, do you live your day in connection with him, being led by him? Do you, do you spend the time being taught by him? See, these, this question... Who do you say that I am? It is perhaps the most important question ever asked. If we believe that Christ is the living God, and I do, it's the most important question. And look how Peter replies. You are the Messiah. Uh, Messiah, a Hebrew word meaning anointed one. Uh, by this time, it had taken on that title that we kind of associate with it, you know, the long-expected, awaited king, though in the ancient Israel, you know, before Jesus' time, 
a Messiah could be anyone who was anointed. King, king, kings were anointed. Uh, sometimes priests were anointed. Anointing is just putting the oil on one. But, you know, it was a significant thing. You were set apart for leadership. But by this time, the Messiah, that was the expected king who would deliver. And so Peter has come to this realization. He's been following Jesus. He's been learning from Jesus. He's been listening to Jesus. He's been taught by Jesus. And now his faith takes a significant advance. They're on retreat. They've gotten out of their context, out of their setting. They're focusing. They're doing some reflective work. And Peter's faith takes a significant advance. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. Peter has now had a deeper, richer, more powerful encounter with the living God. Now, my friends, I suggest to you, this is one of the points of retreat. We go on retreat to advance in our faith. We go on retreat to have a more powerful encounter with Christ. And so when you know, we went on this pilgrimage, and Brian, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell your story, Brian, because you, um, you told it in the reflection, so I know it's, it's, it's open, um, open game. But you know, Brian Thompson was one of the people on our most recent pilgrimage to, to Israel. And uh, one of the experiences you know, that we had was the opportunity to uh, experience a renewal of our baptisms or to get baptized. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do it at the Jordan River. And so uh, you know, we, you know, we were wondering if we had lost this chance. And when we got up to the Sea of Galilee, it's kind of peaceful, quiet, tranquil. And Brian and I were talking because Brian had expressed a real yearning for this. And I was like, all right. And we talked to Bob, who was the pilgrimage director. And, like, and he found a little cove um, that traditionally is believed to be the cove where Jesus did the sermon from the fishing boat. And, uh, and, and, and so it's a lovely little place. And so we went down there, and, and everyone in the group, both our group and the group from Tennessee, had the opportunity to renew their baptismal vows. And many of the people in our group, including Tammy and myself, you know, we, we renewed our baptismal vows. But then, uh, and I think, I think it was Karthik who was snapping photos. I think it was you who, who got this photo. And there's this lovely photo of Brian coming up out of the water with this radiant look upon his face. And as Bob was looking at it, he said, indestructible joy. That is the face of indestructible joy. And Brian really latched onto that. And you can ask him more about this later. I'm probably mangling the story. You can ask him more about this later. But understand this idea. There was a significant advance in faith. When you go on retreat, you get out of your context to focus more deeply upon your connection with God and to experience an advance in now, you know, I, I use this pilgrimage as an example of retreat. Some of you will have the mental model that a retreat is, oh, we just go to a center and we listen to some talks and maybe sing some good music and we sit around and maybe we get some quiet private time for prayer, but it's mostly listening to talks, listening to music, time of prayer, time of fellowship. Those are perfectly legitimate retreats. I have benefited greatly from many retreats like that. But I want you to understand, my belief is when we're talking about retreat and uh, that, that that kind of retreat doesn't always work for everybody. Some of us are wired to be more active. And, 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 and the idea of just sitting and listening and singing and praying just sounds like mind-numbing to them. I rather enjoy it, but some folks feel, would feel like that is just, you know, when can I get out of here? <laughs> and that's why something like a pilgrimage, you know, I, we took this group to, to Israel in December. That is, was a retreat, but it was a retreat 
of a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage is a special kind of retreat where you're going to a place where significant things happened spiritually, and you were trying to walk the places where these things happened, experience some things, and learn from the experiences of the saints of the past. And so pilgrimage tends to be rather active. For us, it was, could be very exhausting going from place to place. You know, still teaching, still lots of prayer time, but it tends to be much more active. Or other people will take a pilgrimage and walk the Camino de Santiago, a, a medieval pilgrimage, uh, going to the cathedral of, um, of St. James in Santiago, Spain. And, and you know, people will take months and walk. It's basically backpacking. But you go from village to village, and it becomes this very powerful, active experience. Another type of retreat, a mission trip. We just heard this morning from folks that got out of their context here in Cincinnati, went to Jonesville, Virginia, went up mountains and worked on houses, and God powerfully worked in their hearts and lives. Missions is a form of retreat. As a matter of fact, it's, that is probably for me the most significant form of retreat that, 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 that has powerfully affected me. Uh, many of you have heard me tell the story of how I sensed a call to ministry. But for those of you who haven't heard it, let me just give you the, the nickel version. My first job out of college, I was working as a technical trainer and for a, a high-tech startup firm, so high-tech, we were putting documents on CD-ROM. This was 1993, folks. <laughs> this is back before the interwebs were, were a thing. Um, and, and, and the company closed. And I'm going through this existential crisis. What's next? What am I going to do? And, and, and it went from, well, what am I going to do to feed myself and to, to, to make money to, well, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? What do I want my life to stand for? What's important to me? Back to the big questions. At some point, if you don't ask the big questions, the big questions will impose themselves upon you. And so here I am, wrestling, wrestling, wrestling all summer long, just trying to figure this out. But right towards the end of the summer, I went on a mission trip. I got out of my context. I got out of my apartment where I'm sitting there looking at my lap, or my, not my laptop, my big bulky computer, and trying to, you know, trying to figure out, oh, do I need to send out more resumes? Got out of that context. And there... As I was working on houses in the summer heat of South Carolina in an intergenerational mission trip with a bunch of teenagers, college students, older folks, working on houses. And I, and I can't even say when it happened. I just know I went on retreat. When I came back, I had direction. I knew I was called to ministry. Now, that didn't mean that, okay, I dropped everything and suddenly went off to seminary. No, it took another three years to kind of figure things out, but I had direction. I went on retreat, and I got an advance in my faith through a missions trip. And as I was preparing for this, as I look back, so many significant moments in my spiritual life have happened on retreat, missions, and pilgrimage. And so I encourage you, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to build seasons of retreat into your life. Maybe you're called to go with us on missions to Appalachia. My dream would be we would do multiple mission trips a year. My dream would be every Sunday school and Bible study in this church would periodically say, we're going to do a retreat and just go to a retreat center and we're going to take a weekend and just listen to the Lord. My dream is that we would be doing, you know, I, one of the reasons I took this group on pilgrimage is I wanted to work that into the regular rhythms of our church. Every couple of years, we're taking a group on pilgrimage. I think Karthik and Jesse and I are talking about maybe doing the, the footsteps of Paul in 2025. That would be another opportunity, another retreat to get out of the context. 
where's God leading you to go on retreat? And just to sweeten the pot a little bit, take a look at how Jesus responds. You know, when Peter has this advance in faith, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So Jesus is recognizing the grace that happens, that God has worked in this. This wasn't some brilliant insight Peter had. God has worked in Peter's life. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So Christ speaks into Peter's life, giving him a deeper sense of his identity as a follower in Christ. When you go and retreat, you have the opportunity to hear that voice. You are my beloved. I'm going to do powerful things through you. And he says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Do you hear that? Jesus gives his followers, his disciples, authority and power to be instruments of his kingdom, to be instruments of blessing, to, 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 to be a part of the building of the kingdom of Christ and to let God's divine power flow through you. You know, we talked earlier about, you know, I gave you the challenge earlier about speaking Jesus into people's lives. That's a part of it. We do it in small ways just by speaking love and peace and goodness into people's lives. And we do it in big ways like going on missions or starting new projects that will be a blessing to people in the community because we are called to be channels of Christ's peace and goodness in the world. Now, some of you will say, well, that was to Peter. Come on, I'm not a super saint. And uh, let me just remind you, yes, that was to Peter. But then in Matthew 18, just a couple of chapters later, as Jesus is giving a general talk to his disciples, and he, and he talks about reconciling differences and whatnot, and he's leading into prayer, and he says to all of his disciples, Matthew 18, verses, picking up at verse 18, write that down, look it up, and check me later. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. There it is, folks. It wasn't just for Peter. It's for you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. All of yous. <laughs> it's for us. We go on retreat. We advance in our faith. And Jesus prepares us for a whole new level of ministry, a whole new level of calling, a whole new opportunity to bless and be his instruments in building the kingdom. All right, I've monologued enough. So I'm going to give you just a, a couple of minutes, and I want you to reflect on this. The Lord has been talking to you all through this worship service. So take just a couple of minutes. We've got that abide page there with two questions. What has the Lord been saying to you through this whole service? It doesn't have to be from the sermon. It could be from any element of it. And what is the Lord nudging you to do? What small step of faith or great step of faith is he calling you to? Let's take a couple of minutes.
Just as a reminder, we do have the Wayfarer Songs Bible study class at 10 o'clock in the chapel. I'm pretty sure we've got children's choir down here afterwards. Is that? Yes. Yes, children's it's choir. So choir. lots going on. Also, be sure to pick up your church newsletters. Those of you who are regulars, we've got them right there in the entry foyer. Pick those up and that'll save us a stamp. So now, brothers and sisters, go in grace, go in mercy, go in peace. May the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>